Good afternoon. <clears throat> Excuse me, my name is Marek Ranis. Uh, my Polish name is Marek. Uh, I really, I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I feel so deprived. Uh, I'll give you a name. I'm an oddball yeah, here, obviously. Uh, I was born in Poland and I live in, in the south of the United States. I work for the University of uh, North Carolina. So I'm kind of zigzagging from Poland through south to to the north and um, over almost uh, 20 years I work in the Arctic not only but focusing on the climate change the evolution of my work I'm inter interdisciplinary artist kind of started with the focusing on the climate change and then moved towards more social political geopolitical and cultural issues um, when I started this a uh, few years after that I actually decided I'm not going to try to convince people about climate change anymore and now it seems to be like we're going in the United States backwards at least 20 years, so the conversation starts over, and so all our work became even more and more relevant. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's me. <laughs> Thank you. So the title subsistence for the exhibition suggests a way of living with the land, um, of a successful relationship um, between humans and the land. Um, the Arctic also has a very complex relationship, as we've heard a lot about in the last um, two days, uh, with the South and with natural resources. So can you comment on local knowledge, indigenous knowledge, um, and what the successful future might look like? <laughs> Let's try it this way. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm the last one again. <laughs> um, so the way I think about um, you know, our relationship with the land is that we are the land. There is no separation. We are part of we are a part of the land. So I never make a distinction and um, that's the way that I was raised. Um, and um, in an earlier panel that I was on it says something about it was Jeremy's panel. Yeah. I was giving him a hard time about it, about ownership of the land and such and so on. And that is just a concept that I think is really, was really alien until, you know, a um, hundred years ago to indigenous people. And what I always tell people is you were at one point an indigenous person. You lived off the land, you were part of the land. So we just need to go back to that place. And, um, and I think that's the only way that we're going to learn. I mean organic farming and all that's really vogue you know, right now, you know, it's really hip, but that's the way we should, you know, people don't want to know where their food comes from, but that's, that's what it is about being a part of the land. You need to be able to harvest and do all of those things, and I'm really happy, and we're very fortunate to be able to have that relationship with the land and community and, um, and being this, you know, in this beautiful place um, in, in the north. <laughs> um, there, as a, I've always been a portrait photographer primarily, and um, whenever I think of the Arctic, I've always thought about its people. It's always been the people first for me, and throughout the whole my most recent project, the I mean, project, the, what some of the things, well, the main two things I've always really focused on, or that have always been brought up right away, is typically subsistence and climate change, um, and how they go together um, and um, you could see a lot of like the one of the most and how can I say this um, sorry uh, the one of the, my most successful photos from the project is a lady that has um, muck tuck all around her my aunt yeah your yeah. aunt yeah <laughs> and uh, as to me it's, I'm really happy that it's, it's been such a well received photo I think it's because it also helps really explain and help people understand uh, subsistence in Alaska and how um, it's not it's not trophy hunting or anything it's about feeding the community and really taking care of your community especially in a community that really has no um, cash economy so this is like a way that they could still maintain their traditional ways and also completely feed many communities around them. I have a song um, a, from the perspective of a whale and um, it says, no, I'm not easy. Uh, but it explains why the whale chooses to give itself 
to um, the community? So how, how does it choose? Because to us, it's a choice that the whale gives. Um, that the, It's a spiritual relationship that we have with the animal, and the, the animal has a choice in giving itself to a crew, and it chooses the crew based on the virtue of the wife of the whaling captain. So the rap song explains that relationship. Um, when I think of <coughs> land, I think right now, my land, Kaktovik, that I'm... Um, not a tribal member, but I'm a corporation member, and I have land there. I have a piece of land there. Uh, they're in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, and there's a push to drill for oil there. There's been one for 40 years. There's been a struggle to push, and um, they're having a meeting, I think, today, the community, to decide where they stand on this issue. And But when the border of the refuge, the community wasn't involved with that border, and the sale of the subsurface rights that the community doesn't own, they weren't involved with that either. So there was a lot of dealings with the land that happened that they didn't have, um, they, they weren't given an opportunity to exert their sovereignty. And so they're put in this very challenging situation with a lot of different pressures. And so I um, created a piece um, that looks at that, that ex that, uh, it's, um, that relationship. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I, I'm actually doing some work with Anchorage Museum, uh, which I may come on to later, but uh, the, I guess like from my perspective, uh, coming from Scotland, uh, the reason that we started as a practice was because of the uh, Scottish independence referendum. And so there was, it was our master's project at university where we actually produced uh, the first Scottish atlas in over a hundred years um, but the atlas itself looked at the future and it was called an atlas of productivity so it looked at how we could potentially use the landscape and seascape more sustainably and uh, I guess like in particular now uh, in a post-Brexit world we were looking at, a, um, at the relationship between Scotland and the north so hence the name lateral north uh, and for us it's like there's so much opportunity and there's so much shared culture and heritage uh, there's also like a lot of challenges that we face in Scotland that are very similar to a lot of the Arctic nations. So that's why we come to these sort of conferences and uh, present our work and want to work uh, with different communities throughout the Arctic because we see a lot of shared opportunities, shared challenges and would like to see potential shared solutions coming from Scotland but also taking ideas back to Scotland to share with people in Scotland. Well, <laughs> it's a difficult question for me because I'm not hunter-gatherer. Uh, but I think that there is a, par there is a paradox on, on some level that we all live in subsistence and we are in the post-industrial world, but we are still gaining our resources from the, from the land. Um, if you look at the descriptions of uh, subsistence, you kind of say that you sustain your life on a minimal level. And that kind of leads us to the idea of uh, late capitalism, which is pretty much built on the idea of constant expansion, so you cannot sustain, you need to expand to actually to, to survive. So this kind of is, there is an interesting contradiction. But at the same time, a lot of economists are actually saying now that in order to actually sustain, you have to start living a subsistent life on some level, so stop growing or control the growth just to be able to, to stay where you are, to kind of stay on a minimal level. So that's an interesting relation for me. Besides the fact that I think that it is bizarre that, you know, we are still driving combustion engine, we are still drilling and extracting um, uh, minerals to get the, get the, get the energy. Um, so I live subsistence in that sense uh, as a part of Western civilization. Um, yeah, in a kind of, I have to say, par parasitic way. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a response to the definition of subsistence as living at a minimum level? So um, my, my father, he's on the Inuit Circumpolar Council and I, We've had this conversation a number of times that, you know, he says, I'm, you know, we Inuit, we are living, we are not subsisting, mm. and we don't have any borders, you know, we are all Inuit. And I, after he said it, it just seems so clear that this word is somebody else's word that mm. has been given to us, and that it's regulated by our state government and our federal government. So that's the way I like to think about it, is yeah. that... Um, we, we, we're living, you know, we're eating what we want. And one of our representatives, Al Kukesh, was um, arrested because he was, he was going fishing for the elders in his community and he wasn't supposed to. And, um, you know, it was a statement that, 
you know, we aren't the ones who are over harvesting our, you know, the resource, the natural resources. Um, it's other people who are doing that. Um, and um, Alaska Natives, Indigenous people have been living off these um, foods for multi-generations and for millennia. And um, it's interesting. They, it, this conversation has been happening in all the Indigenous panels. Like it isn't, we aren't making the rules. They invite you to the table, but they won't listen to you. Or they'll listen to you, but they don't, they don't do anything about it. So I think that's another kind of interesting, um, you know, paradox that, um, you know, we, you get invited to the table, but it's not necessarily, you, you don't have any, there's no effective change, or it moves very slowly. So, um, anyhow. I like the, um, I have a problem with the word subsistence, mm. um, but I, I like traditional and customary use, I think is the best substitute that I found for that, but I'm not mad at it. I mean, you know, when I... <laughs> <laughs> it's just it's hard to find a word that encapsulates you know being at one with the land and having a spiritual relationship to the animal and, and experiencing it firsthand you know hunting I was on a whaling crew for six years and I you know I just it, it was like a crash course in what it really means to be in back of, you know for myself um, or hunting I, I hunted a caribou one once with my uncle and it just um, it was definitely, there was a moment between me and that caribou, and I felt it. And so it's hard to put all of those things into one word. But, yeah. So I have to, I just have to say something about the word traditional, because that's yeah. a word that I do not like. I know. I know. Well, I know that Nick likes customary, and there's a fellow mm -hmm. artist, a friend of ours, who says customary. I like to say, like, historical, maybe. I like that Because better, it's like yeah. a prehistory or whatever, because we're building on traditions every day that's how I feel it's like um, and people always want to tell you the, the materials you can use or yeah. the, the forms that you can use and, um, and, totally and are you a traditional artist or a yeah. contemporary artist and all that kind of stuff so I agree with that yeah. Totally. Yeah. anyhow sorry this panel becomes about semantics it's good yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but how about semantics of contemporary I mean if it's a continuum is that a problematic word as well we're just making a contemporary mm -hmm. today Right? That's the way I think about it. So, to place yourself in the role of artists, um, the Arctic continues to be a place for many outside the region, and uh, that includes artists um, who have descended upon the Arctic again. Can you describe the ways in which your work speaks to your own perspective um, and your own insights, but also becomes a broader representation of place and people? Well, it will be uh, foolish for me to actually call myself a, a kind of ambassador of, of Arctic where I live. But I do feel sometimes that the work I'm bringing work back, represent it. Uh, yeah. it does kind of create a dialogue which I feel responsible to start such dialogue, especially in the lower states, you know, people really have a real interest of understanding what's happening very simplified, uh, very two-dimensional image of place to, uh, in case of Alaska, place to go for a cruise or for fishing or hunting. Mm -hmm. um, and not only in the context of, uh, not only in context of climate change, but also how Arctic is changing culturally, uh, how many people moving there, how diverse become Anchorage in, part in particular. So um, I, I also kind of see my role in kind of making this connection between my experience living in the South and my travels, uh, my travels kind of inspired me to actually, in art, inspired me to go to all the way to Coral Reef in, 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 uh, in Australia because I was trying to find the connection between those two, two places. And I think that all those conversations I was listening to today was all about um, northern nations talking to each other. I think that we should also talk more about northern nations talking to the south mm -hmm. and, and start controlling the, the narrative and start controlling the, the story and, and show it much more true and real image which is really complex and uh, and impact all of all of us living all over the world so that's the way i see my role uh, most of the time i'm not a kind of grandiose idea but a little thing he just he wants to move there he's gonna move I know. there <laughs> yeah i i just agree with mark i just yeah, just say, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you know you can't <laughs> but as a graham as a community 
somebody who's working to create community dialogue and a shared sense of place. I mean, is that a key role for a designer today? Is to yeah, I think so. And the, oh, I guess like the, the project that we've been doing in Anchorage focuses on like one of the most diverse communities in the or the most diverse community in the whole of the U.S. Uh, with over is it a hundred different languages spoke within one community, and so yeah, I guess from my perspective, it's like how does design and architecture contribute to that that place? How does it reflect the culture? So it's not other people's culture are not lost, but. Also, with yeah, with everything that's happening with climate change and global warming, um, these communities are going to become m seen more often. That there's going to be more people migrate to the north. So, uh, how do we kind of prepare for that as as part of the process? We're going to put a wall. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Sandbags. <laughs> Sandbags. Uh, Sonia, Brian, and Allison speaking for yourself and speaking for communities. As an artist, you do you feel the? <laughs> do you feel conflict in that? In in the people moving to the arty? No, in terms or of as an artist representing your own view versus the responsibility to represent a broader view of the Arctic as well, and oh, and of our people. Outside of my culture, or or even for your culture, mm -hmm. in being an individual versus a, a spokesperson for. A You're the ambassador. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Inupiaqs are where. Different. I mean, <laughs> I, I think we're unique uh, in in many ways. But I was talking. We have like, um, I was talking to a reporter earlier. We have. Uh, there's trust that I was raised to be as Inupiaq being because they know who my mom is and they know who my grandparents are and they remember me since I was a baby. I've, it's not like a surprise that I became a performer all of a sudden. The elders around me saw me performing in front of them and my grandfather my, my biological grandmother was a performer and so they encouraged that within me so now when I see you know people um, in my community they they don't question they just see it as a natural outgrowth of who I am and who my grandmother was so um, I think that in uh, so Inupiaqs don't question my own authority in 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 what I say is Inupiaq they don't say that's you're doing that wrong or that art thing was um, I have a lot of autonomy in in my own presence and my own expression um, I you know sometimes I do dis disagree with elders but they they don't stop me from from doing what I feel is what my perspective is on it um, yeah there's I, I just recently helped an artist from the museum go up to Kaktovik and extended myself in that way um, and he was really well received um, but I, I, I don't do that often um, because the, our community is hit with so many different people who are curious that I just a few special people I help them to integrate into the community and he was yeah it was good for him I think it's a really hard thing because I, I don't know, um, you know, my friends who are not indigenous, who are artists, nobody ever asks if they're, you know, anything about their culture or whatever, you know. So it's like immediately they're like, oh, well, you're this. And so, you know, is this all, all your relatives believe this or feel yeah. this way? And <laughs> it's kind of hard. I mean, it's like a perfect example is you when you went down to Seattle and you were yeah. Um, protesting, protesting shell, shell yeah. um, oil, and and then a, a lot of your way. relatives are like yeah. working for the oil companies. You know, it's kind of and my cousin got a, fired after that yeah. from Shell yeah. because she was working, but not because of me. Well, I was there and I was yeah, here, yeah, yeah. but <laughs> she's like my closest cousin. It's it's, it's a it, I mean it's a kind of catch twenty two. You feel this obligation because those are your people, that's your community and your family. Yeah, you know, but at the same time. I can only speak directly for myself, so I don't feel like I am a spokesman, but I do feel um, that I have to be, you know, that I am representing my family and community too, so I, it's kind of a catch-22. So what would my grandma think, you know, that's kind of... <laughs> that's how I would. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I go by these guys, like, what, how would they deal with this? I know. Like, great grandparents. <laughs> okay, so then ask them. So, I think... Your I Am Inuit project is probably 
good example of. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'd say I don't feel. I my myself doesn't don't feel like a spokesman. I feel like I'm doing the best job I can possibly do to go out and document and just get as deep in as, pos as possible. And being a nupiac really, really helps me get into homes and have a long conversations with people that um, any Westerner journalist that's parachuting in wouldn't be able to get. Mm -hmm. um, it's a huge conversation happening right now in the photojournalism world is um, hiring more locals to tell more local stories because you could already, you could, like when the same stories keep coming out, you could tell they're not getting any deeper because they're not getting further in. Um, it's a really great thing that's happening right now in the last, like even just last year for this. Um, there's a lot of things that I think help these conversations happen in um, the U.S. Standing Rock was one of them. A lot of the best images that were coming out of there were from, um, you know, people that were from there in, in, in India. Um, yeah, I, I don't feel like spokesman, but I do feel like do the best job I can to dig deeper and share their stories. So at a time when there's intense interest in the Arctic, how do you balance, and maybe I'll put Merrick and Graham on the spot, the idea of you know, embedding yourself in a place to understand it and to spend time with people and develop relationships versus the people who come for two weeks? versus ideas of cultural appropriation. What are the risks and opportunities with that kind of curiosity? And you know, you talked about the limitations you want to put in introducing people to your place because of the curiosity. How do you, how do you balance curiosity with true awareness and, and value? Well, I, I actually experienced this uh, <coughs> the very first time we met when I came to Alaska a few years ago to work on the film, and actually I, I produced the footage, which was a collection of interviews, a lot of elders, hunters, people living in subsistence. Uh, and I had this whole material ready to be edited as a film, and I realized I'd become, again, another external editor of, this, of those stories, and I dropped the whole project. I did not produce the film. Uh, I shared the footage with my, with my friends for different purposes, uh, but uh, in the end, I learned a lot in terms of the kind of cultural awareness, and and one thing I kind of quickly also understood that I need to uh, remain true who I am. I'm an outsider, and I'm going to present my point of view in the connection, in the context of my experience. But I'm not going to pretend that I'm going back to South and say, oh, "No, I'm now Eskimo." <laughs> <laughs> but you, <don't>. yeah, <laughs> she's going to make you a new. Yeah, you're my next project. I need a good name. <laughs> You know, you know the story about the mayor of, of Anchorage <laughs> named the Walking Crow. Yeah. <laughs> um, Hungry Crow. Or so I think it's, that's all important because there is there is ongoing, you know, there is kind of whole idea of nomad artists and ongoing conversation about appropriation, um, cultural appropriation, inspiration, you know, straight visual aesthetics, but you know, just going gathering the story and then presenting it in a kind of um, national geographic manner, which I don't really aspire to. So, uh, and it's, it's a very risky, it's very, very difficult, and very often I'm actually listening to you guys, I'm kind of feeling a little jealous because you have a kind of very defined sense of identity uh, connected to the place, to the culture, to the language, mm -hmm. to your second name, and um, I don't really have that. I mean, my own country kind of disowned me a little bit because now they think I'm American and I smile too much. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, but that, that's kind of my more, more, my more personal kind of... Uh, a struggle and how can I relate to it and be honest and true and, uh, and not take advantage of opportunities I've given. People invite me to houses and talk to me, allow me to film them or share with me stories and so forth. Yeah. Uh, it's, yeah, it was, I guess, going for the Mapping Anchorage project again. That was like three communities that we worked with. Um, and But I spent an initial two weeks with the communities uh, before we even proposed what we were going to do for the workshops to effectively work with them but then a lot of it was to use their culture and heritage as part of the part of the overall project so uh, the first one was the community that had a hundred different nationalities so it was like inviting them to bring along their own uh, set up or like own recipes for for food uh, and uh, well, we tried to encourage people to bring along their own uh, meals as well which they would then share with the community and that would be part of the community consultation and then uh, in Spinards, which is yeah, the hipster 
uh, part of Anchorage. It was uh, a pop-up prom that we hosted. Uh, but that kind of relates to the fact that there was a, a farmer dance uh, hall, which was one of the first public buildings in that community. And so it was like really trying to, I guess like we were always trying to engage with what's important to the community. And we we're there just as a, as a facilitator to, to try and enact some of these ideas and these opportunities. Um, and respond to, to the challenges. So that's, and uh, that is, we're hoping it is still in its uh, infancy, that project, but the idea is to continue it over the next few years and hopefully it leads to good things. Risks and opportunities of curiosity. Mm -hmm. Thoughts? I know when <coughs> people in the village, the people who do well, who want to learn about the village, you can sense their intent. You know, if you have a good intent and good heart, it will mag uh, radiate out from you and people can just, you don't have to say a word, they're just like, you're, you're good, or you are, you know, come with me, let me show you what's going on, you know, mm -hmm. so we, it's just automatically, and so that writer that was in residence for you, everyone fell in love with him, of course, because <laughs> he's, you know, he's just exuding this authenticity and um, this just pure intent and desire to to really listen to the people for his article about this drilling and normally no one would ever talk to anyone about drilling but the the, the toughest people opened up to him and told them told them everything <laughs> but I wasn't surprised because of how his approach to our community and his um, humbleness and the way he carried himself it you know he was just um, great. Yeah, so that's part of it. People can just mm -hmm. sense that. So for people who are coming or engaging with us, I think if you're really clear about your intent, and um, it's, it, it helps. It will shine through. Um, <coughs> Brian, how about from the perspective of Kivalina and other places right. that are seeing an incredible influx? Right. Um, so risks, like I can't think of, I mean, I, I think of mostly opportunities. And right now, opportunities are great. Um, I feel like uh, grow, as growing up and like watching my dad and seeing my dad's culture and um, I felt like we were, we were never very open, we didn't have a very open dialogue and I feel like it's all changing right now and that, that was me watching my dad and my, my dad's side of the family and my grandparents and everything. We were all very, everyone was very soft spoken and didn't want to talk about anything dramatic. And right now it's all changing, you know, people are really opening up, really talking, and I think social media helps a lot with that, where everybody, you go, when you go into a village, everybody's on Facebook now, everybody's talking, and you're getting angry, <laughs> you know, it's, it's really good. Uh, places like Kibolito, where my family's from, it's about 300 people, it's one of the top three villages that needs to relocate due to coastal erosion, and make a noise about it and they're going to build a new school about eight miles away from the current village and once that happens that'll trigger a whole move for the village and they're going to make a noise now. Risks and opportunities and curiosity. Is that well, I mean, with an intense interest in the place, what are the risks and opportunities with that kind of curiosity? I don't know. I mean, I, I, I guess I've never really thought about it kind of that way. It's, I think that there's some... Alaska, I mean, I, there's a reason I choose to live there. I, like, people are always like, well, why don't you move somewhere else? I'm like, because this is where I belong. And um, so I just feel like, you know, every day I take every day. And there's a lot of opportunity. There's a lot of good art in the North. People don't know about it. You know, I think that's one thing that our museum is working hard to... to um, you know, create opportunity and share, and, and that's why we're all here for, you know, to, to connect and share. But um, I think if people want to work, and I always tell them, you know, I always say, if you want a job, there you can get a job there. Even though we're in a recession, if you want to work hard, you can always get a job. It might not be the job you want, but um, I think in terms of being, as an artist, I never, like, 15, 20 years ago, I made a decision that I wouldn't rely financially on the art, my art, you know, as a, as an economic kind of driver. I found other ways to make money. I'm also lucky to be married to my wonderful husband, who's like, you know, 
pretty financially stable. But I made a I made a goal, and I make jewelry, and I do contracts and arts administration and stuff, so that I could create the work that I want to create. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not someone who's actually um, Christina Lalonde was talking at the earlier on the first session this morning in the other building about you know people feeling this kind of um, that they had to make they have to make these objects for sale, and I think. That is a huge thing in Alaska, and, and mm -hmm. especially in our indigenous population. There's mask makers who have to continue making masks who maybe want to try something different, but they need to pay their rent, you know? So it's, it's, a, it's a reality. Um, but I, I made a decision on my own not to do that. Um, well, sometimes I think I should rethink that. <laughs> <laughs> Paint some mountains. <laughs> so one of the things I think is significant about having all of you here is that when you have conferences about art, it tends to be curators and administrators and organizational representatives, and in this case, policymakers who are being introduced to um, what we have long said is the, the value of arts and culture in a broader conversation. So um, can you become spokespeople for a minute <laughs> about the role that artists do play, not can play? Um, in a broader conversation about our futures um, and, uh, you know, through a non-curatorial lens, how important it is to have a voice at this time. I, I, I love the power of the arts to transform people's um, hearts around certain issues. I, I feel like there's, sometimes people get, get have a hardened heart and one way to soften it is through the power of the arts, through, through immersing them in an environment. One of my goals is to make everyone in Ipiaq. Everybody, you, you could be, you know, which is kind of an impossible you. <laughs> it's an impossible goal, it's so but it's reflective of my culture because if you move to my village and you married in, you, we would see you as in Ipiaq. Um, there's not, there's a like maybe just you know a, a, a difference a, a small difference but you would be included as as if you were you know because you are part of us you you're with us um i i feel that the power of the arts there's so many things happening with climate right now and you know like my own island is sinking and like Kil kivalina is needing to be relocated and i feel that there's um people in the arts, they can have their whole experience or the way they think about things just fall apart and have a new, fresh way of looking at things. So um, I, that's why I became an artist, is to, well, well part of it was because of the drilling in my village, I wanted, I was like, well, how can I educate people around what's facing my people most immediately? Um, but yes, yeah. <laughs> I don't know about Norway, but in the United States, it's actually the media are completely failing us. I mean, we have a handful of uh, newspapers who are able to afford investigative reporting. Um, Europe, you can still see intellectuals being interviewed about issues. We mostly see Angelina Jolie, uh, sorry Angelina, uh, talking about issues. And I, and I think artists are taking a role of uh, reporters, investigators, researchers. We have time often and sometimes resources, my university is supporting me very generously, to actually look deeper and talk about things politicians will not talk for a number yes. of reasons. And we are actually United States in a kind of cultural uh, vacuum. We, are, we feel informed theoretically because media kind of provide this fake, mm -hmm. fake sense of uh, information. But most of the issues are never really raised and really explored on a deeper level. And I think a lot of artists are stepping up and, and Again, I don't. I think most of us kind of feel that we often trying to uncover or bring the stories which are untold, and nobody cares or nobody have a time to look to it. And that's an amazing thing what's happening right now in the 20th century, 21st century. The artists took a role of uh, those institutions which kind of disappeared pretty much. It's kind of what I was going to hit on is with the news, in, I mean, at least for America, it's it's. It's, you're so hit over the head with it, and it's just so easy to just look over it. And then all the best projects I'm seeing that do come from Alaska that focus on climate change or focus on villages that need to relocate, they're all personal projects. Mm -hmm. So all these photographers, they had to write their own grants, they had to go find funding to do it themselves. Mm -hmm. um, 
and it's really important. It's really hard not to get discouraged, <laughs> and it's really hard to just keep writing great <laughs> and keep going. But if, if there's any other artists in the crowd, I'm just say you just gotta keep doing it because if you think it's worth it, it's probably worth it to tell that story. And for oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, so I, yeah, for for me, um, in two thousand and fourteen, when it was the Scottish Independence Referendum, one of the the best parts of that was uh, actually a project called National Collective, which was uh, a completely non-funded, just artists getting involved in the political discourse and creating new pieces of art. So uh, it it actually resulted in the thing being called Yesterval and they uh, travelled around in a series of different camper vans and uh, a variety of different vehicles. They travelled from north to south. Um, and for me, that was one of the most uh, important parts of the whole movement, uh, that, that whole independence movement was that. Um, but I, I think it's uh, like we, when we first started up, we got asked that, do you create architecture, do you create politics? And um, we don't really see a difference, like they, they are the same thing. And I think art is such an important part of the process of, of really challenging the people who make the decisions in our lives. Um, and so, yeah, I would, I would love to uh, see more of it happen, but as you say, it's sometimes it's a project of passion rather than a mm -hmm. project that you're going to get funded for. Uh, so it's, um, so it's, it's maybe that is something that could be looked at, but. I was just gonna ask, like, how many people who can fund us are out there in this room? <laughs> Seriously, did they all leave? I don't know. There's a couple. There's a couple. There's one right there. Right here. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think it's interesting how a lot of times these conferences and stuff, we come together, and the first day there's all these people that make these official speeches and stuff, and then they leave. I think it's unfortunate. <laughs> we should like make it so it's interspersed, you know, and then make the. Actually, I went to a conference. Oh, it was it was in Reykjavik. It was a French um, prime minister or something spoke the last, so everybody stayed till he spoke. <laughs> Remember that? Yeah, but um, yeah. Anyhow, I, yeah, I I don't know what the answer is to any of you know like the financial question that that's it's such a hard one um, because we'll look at where we are right now in the United States. Although I think. Unfortunately, that that guy got elected, but it's really energized. We were talking about this last night. Our, you know, the people. There's a, you know, it's energized our communities um, in a way that it hasn't been. People have become complacent. So. Um, there's a new collective sense. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. People are in it together. There's more mm -hmm. community and dialogue and all of that stuff. So, um, I don't know. You know, people. Even in, as for, like in Alaska, we take care of each other for the most part. We're trying to, you know, take care of each other, but it's not like that everywhere, you know. So um, I always tell people, you know, you're driving on the road. You would never just drive by a car that was stopped. And you'd always check and see if they needed help. And that's something that most people in the lower 48, I don't know about the rest of the world, but people would not stop. They just won't up. stop. <laughs> of course you do. <laughs> we really need to work on this. I know. What are we going to do? This is why I'm still alive. I know. <laughs> <laughs> e e e. No, I just can't. So I wanted to acknowledge our partner, the Northern Norway Art Museum, and Jeremy. Um, yeah. the director of the museum. Is there anything you want to add before we... I actually have a question concerning a piece of art that you might know, uh, made by Olufur Eliasson and uh, oh, yeah. Posing. Which one is it? It, it was uh, the ice cube that they transported yeah. from Greenland to the climate summit. Mm -hmm. in the okay. US. Mm -hmm. And I'm, uh, I'm head of programming at the Royal Library in Denmark. In, in, uh, we are producing a project of the Arctic imagination. And Olaf Eliasson, who was uh, in our program during the spring, he talked about that project. And then later on, Laurent Fabius, the one who conducted the negotiations in Paris, he came and he was our guest. And he told us how much influence that piece had had on the politicians mm -hmm. and the delegated during the climate summit in Paris in, in 15 which led to a res some kind of result anyway. Mm -hmm. So I think that is one of the best examples of how artists can really influence mm -hmm. politicians. Mm -hmm. And I would like your comment on that, please. 
Okay. I personally hate the piece, so I. Yeah. <laughs> 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 well, I'm just wondering, like, how much money was spent to bring that piece over yeah. and stuff like that. I mean, this sounds terrible, but the carbon footing of it. Yeah, the carbon foot of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you don't, you don't think it had any. I mean, maybe, like you said, it maybe it, it worked. I mean, yeah. it's kind of, uh, in a way, for me, kind of romanticizing and simplifying the the issue to become a little circus. Mm -hmm. um, uh, no, but I'm just repeating what the mm -hmm. head of the yeah. So, uh, like I said, it, it might it might have been effective, you know, mm -hmm. uh, in so a, in, in a way. A romantic idea. <laughs> but the question well, is, what would happen if someone would put there a piece of ice saying it's from Greenland, but he produced it in Paris? Mm -hmm. Would it influence the politicians in the same way? Mm -hmm. Would the carbon foods be uh, much lower? Yeah, I mean, and would it have been a spectacle without Olaf? I know, that's what I was going to say too. He's a super blue chip. Well, the question remains, would, is there any other way to make such an even bigger effect without those ice cubes? Ice, ice, you know, ice blocks. The polar bear was holding the ice. It's alive. It's a question regarding the funding structure that was talked about. Because I'm curious about, because you were, you're talking about activism, but also research activism that is really embedded in research. And research is, of course, defined differently between artistic practice and in the university. And, um, and the outreach, the possibility of outreach of it. Because, I mean, we all know that the art world, we, we're a small world, but how do you bring those works to the level of Ola Ferrias on them, who actually create this kind of effect? And what kind of funding structure is needed, actually? Because it's a very different way of producing works than mm -hmm than doing things for sale yeah, or yeah. Yeah. producing a painting which is done quite easily. We need benefactors. And you, know, and the, like, and you need yeah. a different kind of structure of finance, mm -hmm. I think, which is a long-term finance of yeah. work. Than and not focusing on the on the product up front, you know, keeping mm -hmm. this as an open research expedition, exploration, which might lead to different things we don't even know in the next five years. I think that's Anchorage Museum is yeah, good, good doing at doing that. Multi-year and it's projects. based on yes. pretty much on trust. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And especially in the United States, you know, we have to actually fill application which will define very specifically what you're going to deliver yeah. at the end. Mm -hmm. We usually deliver, we actually usually deliver more than that. Uh, but it actually creates a little a little limitation at, up front. And you know, often we have to actually tailor our projects to match those criteria in order to get funding. So it's kind of corrupting our creativity on some level. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, sorry, I, I can't answer the funding aspect, but uh, one thing I was uh, maybe thinking about <coughs> is like, we use a lot of augmented and virtual reality in the work that we do. And um, and I don't know if you ever the, um, the sorry that I can't remember his name the pianist who was on the uh, ice float and there was all the calving glaciers that were happening and he was playing and it was like talking about uh, about climate change and how that was happening and w one of the things that I, I found really interesting was the fact that's a video but it, it it was really powerful but if you were able to actually put that on your head and like experience it so far rather than the the ice cube coming all the way from Greenland to Paris if you could actually take the politicians to Greenland Alaska Canada wherever uh, and and that would be for me one of the most powerful experiences uh, of of, uh, of by doing it that way instead and then you're you're taking people to the Arctic even though they're sitting in Australia or wherever. As, th as they stand in the refrigerator. Yeah, <laughs> well, yeah, potentially. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, it's like the, this technology is like now available and it's because it's going to become huge but there's uh, and, and, and we should really be trying to engage with it as much as possible. So I'm sorry that I can't figure out how to fund all that, but uh, I could at least <laughs> say that's what, in my opinion, is something that could be really powerful in the future. I think through partnerships with lots of different organizations is one way. Mm -hmm. uh, and thinking more in a longer term, you know, like, okay, oh, in five years, this is when the exhibit is. Because it, it gets very challenging when you're trying to turn something around in just even two years. It's, it's you know, there's it's like, oh, I have all these interviews to do and this research and then I... I might, you know, change my idea midway through. So it's good to think in in a longer term and with more partners. Um, to, I think to get things funded. Um, but then you've got to, as an artist, be really smart about the budget and like thinking, okay, how much, you know, time and work and and present it in a way that that makes sense for people to want to partner with you. And 
you know, serves their, you know, mission and their goals and, and, and hits all those notes. And so it's, it's challenging, I think. So I know people have votes to catch and mm -hmm. things to do, but we have Andreas and Eames and then we'll close. I want to go completely back to the, to the theme of the exhibition. Mm -hmm. We're talking about the, the, the way of living subsistence. Mm -hmm. But uh, we can't ignore that the food is changing, yeah. that it got poisoned, yes. and um, that it's actually not very healthy in some parts of the world to live in this uh, traditional way. Mm -hmm. There's a big discussion going on in the Faroe Islands now because they're collecting, also in northern Norway, they're collecting mm -hmm. eggs from, uh, from birds which they actually cannot eat. Mm -hmm. They do, of course, and the doctors are quite help, helpless to, to explain it to the people because the tradition or you know, the historical way they do it is so strong. Mm -hmm. Um, how can we deal with that? I, I think that Inuit are going to, uh, Inupiaks are still just going to eat the whale and they're going to, you know, I mean, uh, it's, it's, maybe we're going to be gone like the polar bear, right? I don't know. No, <laughs> I, I, I feel like um, it's a, a very valid. Um, all our fish have plastics and, you know, all sorts of other things going into them, you know, Japanese tsunami and all of that. I mean, um, it's it's a it's a tough question, but I I'm you know as soon as I get home I'm going fishing. You know my parents are getting there the day before I get there, so um, I think it um, you're not going to stop them from eating their food, but um, I don't know. But that's happening everywhere, you know. Um, so I think it's just a matter of time. I'm such a fatalist. This sounds terrible. <laughs> I know. We could be like the Jetsons and have those genetically engineered little cakes that turn into a burger or whatever. Well, Fukushima but. happened, and I was like, I should label everything in my freezer pre-Fukushima. <laughs> I mean, that was literally a thought That's in my a mind. performance. I know. I was like, every, this is all pre-Fukushima food. <laughs> so it's, safe, it's more safer for me to eat. And I have changed my eating habits. I do eat my indigenous foods less because of the things mm, yeah because of cancer people who are like pregnant women are just you know not supposed to eat as much traditional food. but nothing fills that taste or that yeah, soulness exactly you know there's no substitute for mm. it so you know what am i going to do lick it or like <laughs> <laughs> smell it <laughs> smell it <laughs> spit it back out after <laughs> there's a second question um, because very often uh, at least in Norway, the, to be a Sami artist is also kind of being an ali, alibi artist. For, a what? Uh, to be an alibi, to find the excuse uh -huh. for uh, being used in a certain context. Because it fits very well to an application. Oh. Because there should be a percentage of indigenous oh. people. Oh. And um, I had a lot of discussions in different organizations that worked in Norway. Because I said I'm not interested if the artist is a Sami or not, I'm interested if he's a good artist. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, how important is it for you to be seen as an indigenous artist, or how important is it for you just to be <laughs> an artist? You want to answer? Big question you answer for first, you go. Mm -hmm. um, hang on, that's a tough one. I feel like um, I never really used my heritage to get work. But I know in the last five years, I've been freelancing for 12 years, I know in the last five years it's really helped me on applications to get work, <laughs> you know? Um, but yeah, I feel like with my background and where I come from in Alaska, um, I was always just a photographer first. And yeah, if it, if it benefited me in the long run, or on a certain application or anything, it benefited me. Yeah. I want to cut it the edge of all the art form genres and be on the cutting edge regardless of my heritage and indigeneity. I am, and sometimes it feels unfair because I'm seen in a certain traditional, like, oh no, you need to be in this category. You can't be on the cutting edge, even though your work should be on in this cutting edge category that's your main background. Because you're indigenous, you need to be in this traditional category. And I'm like, but, these are my peers. I want to be with my peers, irregardless. I want to push the edge with them. I want to be right there with them, um, you know, no matter what their background is. Mm -hmm. So it can be frustrating at times. Yet I do feel that I, 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 because of my responsibility to my place and my land and my ancestors, and because of those 
other responsibilities that I carry within me, it, it does bring another deeper element to my work that other some other artists don't have access to. Mm -hmm. But I, it is sometimes I, I do check boxes. I feel like <laughs> just okay. I'm I'm proud to be Alaska Native. You know yeah. I'm like mm -hmm. I I. But I, there was a time when I wouldn't apply if it was an exclusionary exhibition, though, mm. when I was young. I was like, oh, no, I'm just an artist, yeah. you know? But then it's at some point you're like, well, I am a, I'm a woman, you know, so I, I do work that maybe is drawn from that, you know? Um, and I do work that's about place and about community and culture, and um, not all of them are so obvious. Um, I want my work to speak internationally. I want it to speak to everybody. And um, so it's kind of a hard thing, but I don't deny who I am and where I come from. It's really important to me. So um, that's why I live in Alaska. So. I can also answer in my next life, I'm not a middle-aged white man. <laughs> <laughs> I have some plans already. Really? <laughs> what are you going to be? Okay. <laughs> Can't wait. Wait. Please shape this song. Ames, <laughs> right do you want to close this out? <laughs> yeah. I, just, I just wanted to ask a question that it's a little not totally unrelated to that. Is that um, a, as an artist myself, and I think about this a lot, so I'm just curious what you guys think. Is there's a real subtext in this whole conference that art advances an agenda, and um, and sometimes you're supposed to be yeah. advancing agenda on, on behalf of um, indigenous peoples, but even on climate change for the, uh, um, and I just was curious, because um, I have bad news for all of you, that your your work is actually beautiful. You know, I mean, I've seen all of you at this point, if I, you know, didn't know, it, there are parts of your song that I don't know what you're saying, yeah. it's still beautiful. Now I now know that it means X, Y, and Z. And um, so how do you weigh that? How do you wrestle with that? I mean, do you feel, um, do you feel that we're in such a situation that all art has to send, and needs to be measured by, by the you know ice cube at the Paris summit effect that actually you know, or is just curious. I mean, I'm not saying you have. I'm, I'm just putting it out there. So do you artists have to be activists? Question. Yeah. No, it's actually not that. It's a question of how do you wrestle with that. Mm -hmm. I think content is pretty important in what I do, but not all of them are like mm -hmm. you know filled with all of that stuff. Sometimes I just want to do something pretty. <laughs> but it, what I think is pretty is not what everybody thinks is pretty, you know. So I did these pieces about, because um, there's nothing more beautiful than like being with your family and harvesting a moose, you know, um, and, and, you know, defleshing it and all of that. It's like, it's really beautiful. So I did these pieces about that. They're these abstract paintings that are, you know, that that's what it reminds me of. Um, and not everybody wants to look at that or feel that or understand that. But, um, yeah, it's an interesting question. Yeah, I always feel like I have to come from a pure place. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Even if I'm trying to say something, sorry, go on. But I, I grew up in behind Iron, iron ca Curtain, so I mean, the 50 years of uh, art being used as a propaganda in my own mm -hmm. country, over 50 years, kind of, I'm always aware of that. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a part of my experience and kind of, and in the end, kind of realize that you know it's not up to us to decide uh, how you make interpretation of the work. If it's really making a political statement, or it's just you know inspired to actually think about some issues. I think that among all of us, there's quite diversity how we approach the, the, those issues, and that's kind of uh, what I believe in. In the, in the end, the diversity of those um, of those different poems, I call them, you know, will, will, will reach some people. Um, but you know, obviously, sometimes could be heavy-handed, and I'm and, and I'm guilty as charged, uh, and I'm aware of that. And sometimes I'm ashamed. I have a wife who is good at pointing this out. Um, <laughs> so we should like work together because I'm the opposite. I like the subtle. I'm like I'm hiding behind. You're saying I'm not subtle. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I think we could probably vote. What do you guys think? <laughs> Jesus. I know, how do they end up next to this guy, right? I am, right? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for joining us, everyone. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.